Agada part of Talmud is is the story. So that column in the middle is made up of uh, uh, multiple different genres of text. There's halakha, which is kind of the legal discussion. And that's usually the kind of serious part for serious students, right? That's where like the law gets made. But the agada, which is the, the narrative, the story part, is where things get really interesting. Um, and the abstract principles kind of get played out in, in real life. It's also sometimes um, fantastical or uh, imaginative, creative, things like that. These stories, they come and sometimes they try to, they illustrate the point that's being made and sometimes they sort of undermine it, but they always deepen the conversation in a really interesting way. So um, when we study the, the stories, we can, like, I think find ourselves in it a lot easier. It's a lot more human in a lot of ways. And um, the texts that I picked for this class, I think speak to uh, human relationships in different ways. And I have kind of a broad lens on what that means. Uh, today's section, today's session is all about controlling our anger. That's the, that's the title for this one, um, which, you know, that comes up in all sorts of relationships in all sorts of different ways. So our agenda will be to, uh, to go over some of the context of, of our passage. I'll give you the, a little bit of background on, on the setup for this, where, where it comes within um, Talmud. We'll read the story closely and if it's okay with, with uh, the folks who are here, we'll just kind of go around and take turns reading a para paragraph at a time. It's a bit longer than last week's text, but I think we can, we can do it. And then as much as we have kind of time for uh, without going too late into the night, we'll continue the conversation with a few, um, you know, kind of reflective questions on the whole thing. Okay. Sound good? Okay. So here's my, uh, here's my introduction to the context of this passage. And uh, if you're opening up your own Talmud, we're on Brachot, page seven, Daf seven, uh, side A. <laughs> but um, I want to talk first about anger. So anger is self-centered. Anger is instinctual. It's a universal emotion. And it's, a, it's an emotional response, right, to being attacked, you know, criticized, uh, disrespected, degraded, humiliated, ignored, any of those kind of things. And even though it's universal, even though we all do it, it can also be really dangerous, right? Dangerous both for the person who's, who's angry, you know, there are, and whether they express that anger or, or suppress it, you know, studies show that holding too much anger in can give you anxiety, depression, whatever. Expressing too much anger too can give you high, high blood pressure. So anger is not good for the person who's angry. And of course, for the person who's the object of the anger, it can often, you know, lead to, to violence. Uh, so it's really a, a hugely important question as we examine relationships in our lives. How do we control our anger and the times when we feel criticized, disrespected, frustrated, whatever within those relationships? How do we control that, keep it under control and, uh, and you know, manage it in a healthy way? So the rabbis, you know, obviously understood this just like we do. And um, they have took up what I think is a really cool strategy for having these kind of difficult conversations because, uh, you know, they were aware of the interplay between anger and violence. And they're also aware that sometimes anger is justified. You know, sometimes <laughs> there are things worth getting angry about. And also, at least within their framework and in certain circumstances, Sometimes violence can be justified as well. So the problem is when you're talking about anger and how to manage it, is how do you get some measure of objectivity when we're discussing human anger and you know, optimal strategies for, for managing it? How do you sort of take yourself out of the human perspective and examine human anger? It's, it's really difficult to do. So what the Ramais do is sort of map human anger onto God. And then they talk about that. So they talk about God's anger, which sounds like a weird concept. And, you know, regardless of what you or I think about, you know, the real reality of God's nature, whether God is even something capable of anger. And I'm legitimately not certain that's the case. One thing I think is really useful about rabbinic theology is the way the rabbis sort of do this this mapping of human emotions onto God and sort of 
they kind of conceptualize God as like a, a super vivid version of a person. And I was really struggling to come up with the right way to, to describe this. And I think vivid, vivid is the best way I can, uh, the best word I can come up with. Vivid in the sense of like enhanced intensity, greater depth. Like it's not just that God is really big. Like in the Torah, God appears to be a really big person with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, right? Like we just read the Haggadah. The rabbis don't quite think like that. Like they still shy away from the, the anthropomorphizing side of things and the, the sort of interventionalist God. You know, they always, um, you know, sort of say, oh, as if to say that God is really, you know, these ways. But they do, and they do treat God uh, as, as anthropopathic, right? They map human emotions or ascribe human, human emotions to God. And even though that necessarily might not necessarily be my theology, it's actually really helpful for this kind of thing. So they sometimes do this sort of mapping of human emotions onto God and making God a sort of super vivid person in, a, in like a positive, idealized way. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, uh, I'll call up our first text here. This is not the core text, but I've taught this one before, so it might be, might be familiar to folks. So this is from a, a discussion all about um, uh, teshuva, uh, repentance, and uh, asking for forgiveness and all things like that. And here what happens, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak said, they say in the West, that is the land of Israel, in the name of Rabbi Barmari, come and see that the attribute of flesh and blood, that's us human beings, is unlike the attribute of the blessed Holy One. In other words, check out, how, check out the ways that human beings and God are different. So with flesh and blood people, if one insults their friends with words, it's uncertain whether the victim will appease by, be appeased by them or not be appeased by them. In other words, when you insult somebody, you may be able to make it right with them. And you might just not. Sometimes like people just can't be appeased. Like they won't forgive you. And if you, if you say that they will, you're going to assume that, okay, this, you've insulted them, but it is possible to, to appease them. It's uncertain whether they'll be appeased by words alone or will not be appeased by words alone. In other words, you might have to do something else, like pay them some money or fix the broken thing or do something else beyond just apologizing to them to get them to forgive you. But God is different with regard to the blessed Holy One. If a person commits a transgression in private, which they understood to be like the worst possible way you could insult God is in private when you're just one-on-one -on -one in your most private moments. God is appeased by words. As it said in this verse from Hosea, take with you words and return to God. So in other words, God kind of has like super forgiveness powers. Like God is a super ideal version of, of how a person should be. Like always, always forgiving and always forgiving just, just for the asking, right? So that's kind of what I mean with the God in the rabbinic imagination, or specifically in the 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 imagination of the rabbis in the Gemara, God's this kind of super vivid version of a person. When God forgives, it's the most forgiving forgiveness human, humanly imaginable, right? When God loves, it's the most loving love human, humanly imaginable. And when God is angry, it's the angriest anger that you can imagine, right? And they would do this kind of super vivid con conceptualization of God, uh, having human-like human, human -like, uh, emotions, while well, simultaneously saying, you know, Kiv Yechol, as if it were really possible that God was like this. So always sort of signaling that their words are actually not supposed to be taken at face value. So as we read this, you don't have to believe any of these things about God. You don't even necessarily have to believe that this is what the rabbis really think about God. I think this is really um, just a mechanism for them to get a kind of uh, safe distance from the question of, how do we manage our anger so that they can really take a, a good hard look at it? So God, as you know, uh, you know, the Torah describes God having frequent bouts of rage, right? And destructive results. The flood is, is a result of, God, you know, God wiping out human corruption. Uh, Korach and his, his comrades rebel against Moses and God makes a, a, the earth open up and swallow them, right? The Torah views... God's anger from a human perspective, you know, how people experience divine wrath. But the rabbis imagine 
God's anger within the divine itself. So they ask, you know, how does God experience anger? How does God feel about God's own anger? Right? What does God do about it? And like I said, I think this serves to, to create kind of a safe distance for the rabbis and therefore for us to examine these questions about human anger. What makes us angry, right? Is our, is our anger justified or overblown? What effect does our anger have on others? How can we gain mastery over it? We're going to go to a tractate called Brachot, which is the, the first and actually only tractate in the Talmud's first order. There's, there's six orders in the Talmud corresponding to the orders of the Mishnah. And even though there's a bunch of order, a bunch of tractates in the first order of the Mishnah, only one Talmud tractate came out of there. Unclear why. But this is the very first one. It's called Brachot, which means blessings. And it's uh, it discusses mostly rules of blessings and prayers, mostly Shema and Amidah. So our passage comes in a discussion of prayer, which the rabbis established as a mitzvah, right? They lived uh, right at the end of the second temple period and immediately after its destruction. They established prayer as a, a Jewish religious obligation taking place at the sacrifices that were offered in the temple, right? If we pray then, and God is a super vivid version of a person, what does that mean about God? It's natural for the rabbis to imagine that, in fact, God prays as well. And it, that might seem strange and might seem counterintuitive to us. But for the rabbis, actually, we pray because God prays. You know, we follow God's model. Super vivid version of a person. Okay. And if you can come up with a, a better descriptor than that, than vivid, I would love to hear it. Because I think it's close, but maybe not quite exactly what I'm going for, but it's very close. So... This is a long passage. We, we have what's here and actually on to the next page as well. And I think what we'll do, if, if folks don't mind doing a little reading, we'll read um, just one paragraph at a time and talk about it and another paragraph and talk about it. I've chunked it up already so that I um, shouldn't have to stop anybody uh, midstream. And uh, you should hopefully just be able to read right through. And if you're having a hard time seeing it's too small on your screen, just, uh, just up at the top, you should have some Zoom controls. Um, uh, the, that you should be able to zoom in a little bit, if that makes sense. Margaret, are you are you able to zoom in and see like you need to? Are you able to read? Yes. Would you mind going first? You're already off of mute. Yeah. The, Wonderful. Thank you. Rabbi Yohanan said in the name of Rabbi Yose, mm -hmm. how do we know that the Blessed Holy One prays? Because it stayed, I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of my prayer. The verse does not say the house of their prayer, but rather the house of my prayer. Hence, the Blessed Holy One prays. Thank you. So, Rabbi Yochanan uh, was the son of somebody named Nacha, and he lived in the, the late second, early third century in the land of Israel. And He's sharing a teaching that he learned from Rabbi Yose, who's a, a student of Rabbi Akiva. And he's answering our question, right? How do we know that, that God prays? And he's doing it by exploiting a feature of Hebrew grammar, of, of grammatical construction, that I think for the sake of time, we don't, we don't have, you know, can't really go way into. But I, I, tra I, I rendered it there, at least in an English transliteration. God in the, the, the book of Isaiah, uh, the prophetic book of Isaiah, says, I'll bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in the house of my prayer. In context, Isaiah is clearly talking about the temple, right? The house of my prayer or my house of prayer clearly means the temple in Jerusalem. Holy mountain, Mount Zion, whatever. But what Rabbi Yochanan says, the way he uses this as a proof text, he says, you know, it doesn't say the house of their prayer, like those human beings and the prayers that they say, but rather the house of my prayer. And if there is such a thing as Beit Tefilati, a house of my prayer, clearly God has prayer. Clearly God prays, right? Okay. If God, if we accept that premise, that God prays, what sort of questions arise in your minds? And Anne and Adam and Margaret, help me with the brainstorm. What sort of questions do you want to know? What 
if we assume that God prays, what, uh, what follow-up questions do you have? And Yeah, so who is he praying to? Himself? Okay, good. Himself. Yeah, what else? What does they pray? What does they pray about? Sure. Yeah. Or maybe like, what what prayer does God pray? Like, what are the words or the the substance of it? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, any, any other ideas? Isn't there things where God is attributed to saying right. that He is pleased with His own work? Sure. I mean, when, during Sometimes. the creation. And when, we're things, doing, when we're doing things right, yeah, God's, <laughs> God's probably pleased. So yeah. couldn't he just be expressing delight in something without attributing it to somebody else? I mean, that he isn't praying to a higher pray- person oh, I see what of you mean. any kind. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably from a rabbinic perspective, um, they are interested, as we'll see, in the question of, you know, what is the content of God's prayer? But they don't really seem to address the idea of, like, who or what does God pray to? I think they take for granted that there's nothing nothing up above that, right? <laughs> Whatever it is that God is praying isn't m- maybe not to or at anyone or anything. And I, I yeah, I think there's, a, there's ways to understand Jewish prayer is not necessarily at or to anything either, but um, we do do prayer in, you know, some pretty structured ways. There's, there's prayer three times a day, right? So if we pray, if we have a when to our prayer, we might ask, when does God pray? <laughs> of course, why does God pray? Is maybe a related question to what as well, right? <clears throat> the Talmud's going to try to answer at least those three. What does, what prayer does God pray? When does God pray it, and why does why does God pray? This passage is going to try try to answer at least uh, at least those three. Okay, I guess it kind of begs the question of the definition mm-hmm. of prayer. Oh, totally. <laughs> we pray. Totally. Which we I think I think you've hit on something important that, given another run up to this, I might prepare a little more. Um, I sort of have a, already a concept of prayer because I've. Well, I've lived in the, I've sort of lived in the rabbi, the rabbi's idea of what prayer is and what it's supposed to do. It's both um, extemporaneous, like it's supposed to come from your heart, but it's also structured and, you know, supposed to be done in a certain way at a certain time and things like that. Um, I think that's it's in, interesting and important too. And I think that's just not the direction we're going to go tonight. <laughs> but I think you're right. <laughs> that's an important question is what even is prayer? But just taking taking for granted that God does pray and that it more or less resembles the way human beings pray. Okay, we have we have some some follow-up questions. Uh let's see. Adam, you're you're highlighted next. Do you mind uh taking that second paragraph there? Um sure. <clears throat> the Gemara asks what does God pray? Rav Zutra Bar Tovia said that Rav said that Rav said, God says, may it be my will that my mercy will overcome my anger, and may my mercy prevail over my other attributes, so that I may deal with my children through the attribute of mercy, and on their behalf stop short of the letter of the law. There's a lot in there. There is a lot in there. Yeah, part of it. Part of what's confusing is what they call the trident, the the sort of attribution part. Yeah, because this is something Zutra Bartovia said that he heard from another guy, Ra. All right. So it's it's Ra's statement, but the Talmud is getting it through a chain of uh, a transmission here. Yeah. But it's trying to answer the content of God's prayer, and yeah, what do you uh, what do you make of this? Okay, who are let's see. Who are the children? Well, it's just people. I mean, that's us, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, God is praying that God's mercy will overcome God's anger, and that God's mercy will prevail over my other attributes. What are, What do you think other attributes might be talking about? Probably one that's most important. Um, think about Rosh Hashanah. Oh, well, I mean, 
of course, forgiveness, but that's that's not the opposite of what before that, yeah. Um, um, hmm. uh, trying to remember. That's okay. That's okay. We're we're at sort of the opposite end of the counter. Actually, almost exactly on the opposite end of the counter from Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, it, let's see. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, so Rosh Hashanah gets called Yom, Yom Hadin, right? The day of judgment, the sort of conceit of that, of Rosh Hashanah and the high holidays, right? Is that right. this is the opening of the period where humanity is judged. God is like sitting on the throne of judgment and here's us asking for mercy and, and trying to be written into the book of life, even though we might not, might not truly deserve it, Right. So I think the other attributes, the other attribute, like the key one in particular is God, God's attribute of judgment. Yeah, right, judgment. Cool. Okay. So if that's the case and God is saying, you know, let me, let my mercy prevail over, over my, you know, sort of impulse to judge so that I can deal with my, with all these human beings who are, you know, screwing up all the time mm -hmm. through the attribute of mercy and on their behalf, stop short of the letter of the law. What do you think that last line might mean? Well, that one's pretty clear. Um, okay. Yeah, that, you know, the law could be very cut and dried and black yeah. and white, and the punishment could be swift to sure, uh, but he's trying to um, uh, modify that or to soften it. Or yeah. Mercy, yeah. Right, right. So we may well deserve not to be written into the Book of Life yeah. based on what we've, what we've done or not done, right? Yeah. But here what... Rav, Rav Zutra is saying that Ram says, putting words in God's mouth, what's the prayer that God prays? God prays that God will, God's mercy will win out mm -hmm. and won't deliver strict, you know, God won't deliver strict judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does this imply about God's like internal decision making here? Is it like <clears throat> totally considered and rational and reasonable and 100% and accurate all the time? Actually, well, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, well, well, it's short, short of acknowledging that God is all powerful, but people are fallible. Definitely. And we're there's, you know, we're supposed to seek justice, but boy, what we really need is mercy a lot of the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and but and yeah, sorry, go ahead, Anne. Yeah, and and that they have a tendency maybe to rush towards judgment and to be angry at these fallible people because they're just always messing right. up. Right. So they're trying to let their their better self prevail. Good. So so in this conception, God has kind of an anger management problem, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like God, God would prefer to dispense mercy rather than judgment, but apparently is sort of internally conflicted and somehow struggles to suppress divine anger in favor of divine mercy. So this is why this is this is the what of God prays of what God <laughs> prays at least according to Rob, God prays for restraint, God prays for God for self control. But isn't he praying to himself in a, in a sense, sure. uh, using the pronoun him? Sure. Um, yeah, you uh, folks have been using he him all the time. I, yeah. I as far as I'm concerned, God's pronouns are God, God, and God's. But <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna correct you. You, you do what oh, works no. for you. I'm just yeah using the common shorthand, but that's okay. It does uh, make the, things more straightforward sometimes. Yeah, the the yeah, is he's sort of appealing to his, his her its mm -hmm. own self, <laughs> uh, and you know, but you right. see you see various <laughs> variability in how God meets out right men or mercy we, and justice all through the Bible, and oh, it's. Cool. He could, be, he could be all over the place. I mean, and, and it, that is also um, stumped scholars sometimes sure. about why it was this or that. So this is kind of a focusing right down on yeah. the internal process that's going on. Right, right. And yeah, right. And this is also super human, right? People do this kind of self-talk thing all the time where they try right. to convince themselves <laughs> to be, you know, more brave or more outgoing or, you know, whatever it is. We sort of right. talk, our, talk to ourselves like this all the time. Right. That is kind of a, a prayer of sorts, right? This kind of self-talk. Okay. So next, the Talmud introduces what's called a baraita, 
Uh, this is like a Talmud studies word that's, that's worth knowing. So Baraita, it, it means like something outside. So it's a tradition, it's a received oral tradition that the, these rabbis knew, but that wasn't recorded in the Mishnah. This is sort of, they knew it, it had been transmitted orally, it's getting written down here for the first time. So they bring it into the conversation to kind of advance the, uh, you know, advance the, uh, uh, you know, the, the narrative a little bit. So they introduce a Baraita that's a little bit confused about where it came from. And you wouldn't necessarily know this from, from just looking at it, but I'll tell you that there were two Yishmael ben Elishas. What used to happen was like a father would name their son something. Like in, in this case, what happened, there was a Yishmael ben, uh, Yishmael ben Elisha, a, a, someone named Yishmael whose father was Elisha and named his son Elisha. Elisha then named his son Yishmael. So basically every other generation, you'd have Yishmael ben Elisha, Elisha ben Yishmael. One of those, the grandfather in this case, was the high priest. His grandson, also Yishmael ben Elisha, was one of the rabbis. So it says, taught in a brighta by uh, Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, the high priest. He wasn't both rabbi and high priest. The attribution is confused here. They put in the they put the title of rabbi, but because of what's going on here, as you'll see, it's almost certainly the guy who was the high priest, his grandfather. Okay, and you're up. Do you mind reading about what uh, Ishmael ben Elisha taught? Sure. Please. So it's taught in a barita that Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha, the high priest, said, once on Yom Kippur, I entered the innermost sanctum, the Holy of Holies, to offer incense. And in a vision, I saw, help me out here, a, kat a katriel ya. A Katriel Ya, the Lord of Hosts, yeah, one of the like, names of God. Yeah, yeah, so this is not a super common one, but it's pretty clear he's talking about, you know, we call we call God uh, Lord of Hosts fairly mm -hmm. regularly in the liturgy. It's clear he sees a vision of God and just gives God a, a name. Know, relatively us unusual name, but still, it's clear he's, he's having a vision of God. Okay, onward. Okay, seated on a high and exalted throne. And God said to me, Ishmael, my son, bless me. I replied, may it be your will that your mercy overcome your anger and may your mercy prevail over your other attributes so that you may deal with your children through the attribute of mercy and on their behalf, stop short of the letter of the law. And God nodded God's head and accepted the blessing. This event teaches us that you should not take the blessing of an ordinary person lightly. Okay, so we have the high priest, Ishmael, who reports having a vision um, well, while you know, inside the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur of God, who does something really surprising. He, God asks a human being for a blessing. And what is the blessing that Ishmael gives? It's the prayer that we had it's exactly the same text before. right yeah okay so what what are what are two possibilities for how this could be the case that he already knew that god had this prayer for himself and so Good. he was reflecting it back to god oh okay okay uh yes right okay right so he's yishmael is sort of like discerning um, you know, God's, I guess, okay, maybe that is a third possibility, that he somehow already knew what God was up to. That's, that's possible. I had two other thoughts. What are, what other ways, how else could we explain this, this similarity? Well, also, I mean, I don't know the chronology of Rabbi Ishmael and Ah, good question. Rob, right? Rob is later. Okay. So then what we read previously was picked mm -hmm. up already from what R Rabbi Ishmael had said. Good. So if that's the case, then if Rabbi is correct, and this is the prayer that God said, where did God learn the prayer from? Ishmael. From Ishmael, right? From people. If, and that's so this, so this yeah. could be sort of the backstory of Rabbi's mm -hmm. teaching, right? Mm -hmm. That Ishmael taught God this prayer, and now that's the prayer God says every day or whatever to, you know, overcome God's anger. So that's cool. Yeah. God to whom we pray learned to pray from us. That's cool. I think the other one, which is close to what you were getting at, and 
you know, maybe he already sort of knew what was going on in God's head. Yeah. But maybe he just, maybe Ishmael just sort of came up with the blessing, you know, on the spot and somehow discerned God's deepest need and God's deepest desire. And, and accordingly, it provides a prayer that, that reinforces God's, God's effort to achieve this self-control, right? <laughs> Over divine anger. And Re- Ishmael responds to God with, exactly what God is, you know, needs with patience and love and above all mercy. Ishmael is not judging God, right? Ishmael is actually modeling self-restraint back to God. Well, it could also be a little self-serving. We I want mean, God to be merciful <laughs> and to okay, not be angry. Okay, I'll us, buy that right? too. I'll buy, yeah. I hadn't thought of that, but I will buy that too. Absolutely. Yes. Good. I think, especially in light of what we're going to think of when, when we talk about the potential consequences of God's anger Mm -hmm. I buy that I buy that a lot that's that's entirely possible okay how do you understand that conclusion the the this event teaches us that you should not take the blessing of an ordinary person lightly I have I sort of have two thoughts about what what this means if an ordinary person can bless God Mm -hmm. then their blessing to me should also be taken at that same level of of sanctity, I guess. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so like we shouldn't if if someone blesses us, and maybe we consider them ordinary, or you know maybe beneath us or something like that, we should accept those blessings, right? Grace, mm-hmm. you know, graciously and gratefully, because yeah, yeah, even God accepted this 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 human's blessing, right? Okay, I think that's. That is definitely one surface meaning. But Yishmael ben Elisha is not actually an ordinary person. He's the high priest. So maybe we're supposed to think of ourselves as more than just ordinary people whose blessings would be of little value. Like if our blessings, like if Yishmael's blessing has the power to help God, then our blessings could potentially be that powerful to help God control God's deadly powerful anger right and if so surely we have then the power to control ourselves if we were to do this kind of thing you know saying these this kind of prayer to ourselves may it be our may it be my will that my mercy overcome my anger that should work right we have the power to bless in such a way that we can Hmm. can, you know help god control god's anger and also even control our own Hmm. yeah yeah. Yeah. this is <laughs> cool stuff i know <laughs> okay back to the topic of anger there, there's so much there's so much more here that like we could we could dig into all this forever uh, but i think the the there's a payoff at the end that's worth getting to okay so um back to the topic of anger um i think wait margaret margaret's up again right yeah all right more, more from rabbi yochanan if you would rabbi yochanan father said in the name of rabbi Yossi, how do we know that one must not try to placate a person when he is angry? Because it is written, when following the sin of the golden calf, Moses requested that the divine presence rest upon Israel as it had previously. God said to him, my face will go and I will give you rest. The blessed Holy One said to Moses, Wait until my face of wrath will pass, and then I will grant your request. Okay, so does everyone remember the scenario we're talking about? Israel has just made the golden calf. Mm -hmm. God is really upset and wants to destroy destroy the Israelites and start over. And Moses is like, no, 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 just calm down. You know, don't don't destroy these people. It's going to be a really bad look if you destroy Israel uh, over this. And so requests that, uh, you know, God overcome God's anger and that, that the divine presence come and uh, be with Israel again. This is, I mean, for one thing, this is really great advice, right? Don't try to placate someone when they're angry because they can't listen to you. They're too angry. They can't hear it. They're, you know, white hot with rage. <laughs> you know, uh, I think this is, yeah, this is great advice, especially for people who are married, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's better to wait until everyone calms down and then try to solve the problem, right? So for Rabbi Yochanan, and remember, this is the same guy from the top of the page who did that cool trick with the grammar. 
he's going to do another kind of creative reading here. For him, the, the mention of God's face sort of invokes an image of God's anger as if God's face is red with, with fury. And he again reads creatively. And again, we don't quite have time to go dig into this, but that line, uh, my face will go and I will give you rest. That doesn't make a ton of sense in English. And the truth is it's a little ambiguous in Hebrew too. So Moses asks, like, please, you know, let your presence come back with us. And God says, and that gets translated in the JPS translation as like, I will, I will go in the lead and I will lighten your burden. Some kind of straightforward a, a statement of assent. Um, there's another translation that sort of makes it a question. Like if my presence were to go with you, would that give you, would that cause you to rest easy? So Yochanan is being super literal and reading this to say, my face will go. In other words, my, my angry face will go away. Once that happens, then I will give you rest. Then I, then I will, you know, uh, uh, you know, come bring my, bring my presence back and everything will be okay. So he's reading this creatively to say, don't try to appeal to God or anyone when they're angry. Let the, let the face of anger pass and then, then make your request. Okay. This is cool, but actually not even the coolest part. So a quick roundup and we got, and then we should keep going. We've established that God prays. Why? To achieve self-control over divine anger. And God apparently seeks human help in achieving this goal, which we can apparently provide if we are, you know, appropriately circumspect about it. So we've answered the, that first question of what God prays, and to some extent, the why. We're going to get into the question of when. Okay, uh, I think, Adam, you're up next. Can you read that last paragraph? Okay. <clears throat> the Gemara asks, but does the Blessed Holy One get angry? The Gemara answers, yes, as it was taught in the Bara. Right. right uh, yeah, it's another another tradition they're bringing in. Right. God is furious every day. How long does God's anger last? God's anger lasts a moment. And how long is a moment? One <laughs> thousand eight hundred and eighty-eight part of an hour. That is a moment. Okay, one fifty-eight thousand eight hundred and eighty-eighth part of an hour. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. So there's sort of two questions addressed here, right? So first is, you know, does does God really get angry? Obviously, you know, yes. Uh, but really the question is when? When is God angry? Every day. Because we have a we have this verse in the Psalms that says literally that God is furious every day. There's more going on in context, but that's enough of a proof 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 text to tell us God gets angry every single day. How long do, though does that last? Is it like all 24 hours or what? Here we don't actually have a proof text. Um, maybe because there isn't one, there's really no sense of where, no, where this number comes from. But we will have proof text later actually for the sort of the idea that God is only angry for a brief amount of time. Um, anyone want to take a guess about how long that is? <laughs> Yeah, it's like a nanosecond. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's really not a lot. So it actually it actually depends on what time of the year it is. Yeah. Because the a halakhic hour isn't one hour the way we think of it. It's one twelfth of the daylight part of the day. Mm. So it's a long an hour is longer in the summer and shorter in the winter because there's more daylight in the summer and less in the winter. Mm. But if we assume and that here I'm relying entirely on books that I've read about this, because I, I can't calculate this myself. If we assume it's like a totally average day, like at the fall or, or, or uh, spring equinox, then it's about a 16th of a second. <laughs> about a 16th of a second is, is how long God is angry for, but every day. Okay, how much damage do you think I, a human being, could cause if I stayed angry for one 16th of a second? <laughs> Not a lot. How much? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a little, but not a lot. Like maybe some, but like really not that much. But remember, God is like a super vivid person version of a person. 
So God's anger is the angriest anger that could ever be angered. How much damage do you think God could cause in a 16th of a second? A lot. Yeah, I think that's what we're supposed to, right? We're, it's a good thing. It's so, it's so little. We have to assume that, you know, even a brief flash of anger for God could be absolutely devastating. And I think really, you know, the corollary holds true for us as well. You know, even a brief flash of anger can still really cause, you know, a, a single word spoken in anger can really, you know, rupture a whole relationship or, or really cause a lot of real damage. Okay, so we know God is angry for about a 16th of a second every day. When? What part of the day? Yeah. Yeah? How, right? So when does that mean? So, so did, did you have a thought? Oh, okay. No. But, you, but you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like so when you, we first wake up. <laughs> okay. Good thought. You may be on, you may be on track, actually. You're closer than you think. So, so to, to start to answer this, the Gemara is going to bring the story of Balaam. Okay. I told you there was a lot. This is, we're going to get, we're going to get through this, but it'll be great. Okay. So Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet who gets hired in, in the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 22. He gets hired by the Moabite king Balak to try to put a curse on the Israelites. So that Balak, Balak's scared of the Israelites. You know, they've, they've come out of Egypt. They're this huge, you know, force and thinks that by hiring Balaam to curse them, Balak can ensure the Moabites victory over them. And the story's kind of hilarious. Balaam famously fails. What, it, when's it, what ends up uh, coming out of his mouth is what we start service with, services with a lot of days. Ma tovu Yaakov, Yisrael. How, how good are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. He also famously gets into an argument with a talking donkey and ends up looking like kind of a doofus. So that's Balaam. It's important, though, to, to, to have that set up to read this story. Okay, whose turn was it? Anne, I think it's you. The Gemara adds, and no creature can precisely determine that moment when God becomes angry, except for Balaam, the wicked, about whom it is written. He who knows the knowledge of the Most High. Could it be that he who did not even know the mind of his animal did not know, did know the mind of the Most High? Rather, this teaches that Balaam was able to precisely determine the hour that the Blessed Holy One is angry. At that moment, Balaam would utter his curse, and through God's anger, it would be fulfilled. And that is just what the prophet said to Israel. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and how Balaam, son of Beor, responded, so that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Hmm. Okay, so Balaam is a really interesting story because on the one hand, the Torah clearly considers him to be the real deal. Like he clearly could have cursed if he had, you know, been able to. He was apparently, you know, effective at least, despite being a non-Israelite. It says, you know, literally he, he knows the knowledge of the most high. But at the same time, here's this guy who who gets in an argument with a talking donkey and is like, you know, really comes off lo looking like a doofus. So for the rabbis, the, the Balaam story was, was a story about God's restraint. That last line where it has Micah, uh, draw, draws from the, the prophet Micah, remember what, what uh, you know, B Balak did, so that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So there's lots and lots of examples of God, um, you know, showing restraint. The people are whiny all through the wilderness, right? They're whining about all kinds of stuff, but God still, you know, brings them through and feeds them manna and brings them to Mount Sinai and all this, you know, and lots of, uh, you know, in the prophetic books as well, the people are constantly screwing up and God is, you know, to varying degrees, you know, showing restraint. But it also opens up a new issue here, right? how far might we let our, our anger carry us? Balak is clearly, you know, angry or, or you know, interested in taking, taking uh, action against Israel and wants to try to use this moment of divine anger to do that. So if, 
if God is really angry for one sixteenth of a second every day, and it is theoretically possible to utilize that through uttering a curse at just the right time, would any of us, you know, what would any of us do if we possess that knowledge uh, and and the opportunity and capacity to exploit it? Right? Would we would we make like would we use it like Balak and Balaam to try to try to seek revenge on our enemies? So before the Gemara, you know, answers directly. The Gemara is going to think a little bit more about that precise moment of God's anger. And remember how only Balaam, like it says, no creature can precisely determine that moment except Balaam. Well, there is one other idea, sort of. And I can't remember who's up next. Are we back to Margaret? Yeah. Oh, Margaret. Yeah. Can you read the second paragraph? What's meant? What is meant by the statement so that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord? Rabbi Eliezer said, the Blessed Holy One said to Israel, see how many acts of kindness I performed on your behalf, that I did not become angry during the days of Balaam the wicked. For had I become angry, there would have been no remnant or survivor remaining among the enemies of Israel. A euphemism for Israel itself. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, God restrained God's anger and Balaam's curse went unfulfilled. And that too is the meaning of what Balaam said to Balak. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I condemn whom God has not condemn condemned? This verse teaches that all those days, God was not angry. Okay. Sorry, I I forgot to, to we should have read that part a little bit before before I before I stopped to talk. I think we were supposed to read two paragraphs there, but that's okay. The, this is basically just another another uh, further expansion of the Balaam story. You know, the the righteous acts of God. God is actually doing us a big favor. God is doing something righteous and, and compassionate for us every time God restrains God's anger. Uh, uh, you, you know, and including. Um, that verse in Numbers, how can I, when Balaam says, how can I curse what God hasn't cursed? How can I condemn what God hasn't condemned? Apparently, God, you know, God didn't, uh, you know, didn't get angry at that time when God was, in theory, supposed to and, and somehow foiled Balaam and Balak's plan. So was that because God was trying to foil that plan or he just yeah. happened to not get angry on this. Yeah, plans. no, that's, I think that's how we're supposed to read this is, is like God knew that this was, God knew that Balaam had the power to, to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and as a righteous act, as an act of mercy to Israel, God restrained God's anger at that moment. Okay. Right. Which otherwise would have happened and would have destroyed Israel. Okay. All right. So here's what I, here's what I was talking about, about how there's, um, Maybe one other idea about how, you know how to determine the precise uh, moment of God's anger. I think we're let's see back to Adam. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and and how long does God's anger last? God's anger lasts a moment. And how long is a moment? We've heard this before. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Avia, and some say Rabbi Avina said a moment lasts as long as it takes to say a moment. <laughs> Rega in Hebrew, yeah, that's as long, that's how long it is. <laughs> how do we know that God is is only angry for a moment? Because it is stated, for God is angry but for a moment, and when God is pleased, there is life. There you go, right? Or if you prefer, say instead, from here, as it is stated, hide yourself for a brief moment until the anger passes. A brief moment meaning that God's anger passes in a mere moment. The Gemara asks, when is God angry? Abaya, Abaya said, during the first three hours of the day, when the sun whitens the crust of the rooster and it stands on one leg. <laughs> I know, it's great stuff, right? <laughs> the, days. the Gemara asks, but doesn't the rooster stand that way every hour? Mm -hmm. The Gemara answers, the difference is that in every other hour when the rooster stands in that way, there are red streaks in his crest. But when God is angry, there are no red streaks in his crest at all. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So, Anne, you laughed. What, what made you laugh here? Just the, the description of the rooster standing on one leg. <laughs> okay. So, um, because roosters do do that all the time. Okay. So, good. I was hoping that there was somebody with more, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, farm living experience who could tell me about, <laughs> tell me about the reality of this and if, if roosters actually do do that. I, I gather they do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, we're again asking, you know, how long does God's anger last? We're sort of rehashing this. And whereas, you know, previously someone just said, okay, it's like a 16th of a second, but couldn't really offer any backup. Here we're again answering a moment, but this time we do have proof texts. We have two, in fact, uh, from, from scripture, one from Psalms and one from Isaiah. And then with this other, this idea, which, which we wanted to know from the previous discussion, okay, when exactly, what part of the day is this? And what we have is Abaye, who is a, a fourth century uh, Babylonian rabbi, who says, it's when the crest of a rooster changes color in the morning. So he says the first three hours of the day, remember that we're talking about uh, halachic hours. So the, take the daylight part of the day, divide it by 12. First three hours are the first, the first quarter of the day. So, you know, imagine a, you know, a perfectly square day, Sunrise is exactly at 6 a.m. and sunset exactly at 6 p.m. We're talking like 6 to 9 a.m., you know, immediately after sunrise. Uh, okay, so it's like first, first thing in the morning, the sun whitens the crest of the rooster, or maybe it makes it appear white. Um, good. I'm, I'm glad you have some idea what he's talking about. I guess maybe there is some, some moment, like just as the sun peeks over the horizon, where the light is different and things lighten and seem to change color a little bit. That's, that's the best I can figure. I can't really give you any more insight into what this, what this means, but apparently Abaye, you know, this was his, this was his idea. Okay. okay. So we, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> they, a rooster, I, I used to raise chickens. Oh, okay. perfect. Thank a you. Margaret. Yes. Tell us will stand on one leg. It doesn't okay. stand there for a long time. The way Oh. Some other birds do, right? Okay. But it will stand on one leg and then the other one. Oh, okay. So that you can say it's standing on one leg. It's just alternating. <laughs> so there is probably but, some, so some does movement. Does that go back to this it being brief? Yeah, because he doesn't do it yeah. for three hours. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure he's saying he's, I'm not sure about he's trying to say it happens all three hours, but it's sometime in that. You in know, that time early, period for that early morning time frame when this all the, there'll be an instant in there and i guess if it was always exactly the same time every day well then we might be able to figure it out but it's like this is maybe he's trying to say it's it sort of moves around but it's always sometime in the morning right yeah okay awesome all right so let's recap a little bit before we before we uh you know get to the big finish we know that god prays we know what God prays for, which is for, for self-control to restrain divine anger. Uh, we know why, because, uh, you know, God becomes angry every day for a short interval, apparently, you know, right at the beginning of the day. Um, and this brief moment is still incredibly dangerous and could potentially be taken advantage of. So when does it, like, to try to answer that second question, when does God pray? I think it, it, this passage never says explicitly, but I think it, we're supposed to understand that it must be right before that, right? Okay. Now, a story of someone who was was provoked and succumbed to temptation, because apparently God is not not uh, you know acting on this anger necessarily every day. Well, or well, we'll see. Um, who are we on? Anne? No, Adam. I don't remember. Um, I think it's me, right? Man, thank you. Yeah. The Gemara relates. Okay, so the Gemara relates. A certain heretic who is in Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi's neighborhood would upset him with his interpretations of verses. One day, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi took a rooster and placed it between the legs of the bed upon which he sat and watched it. He thought, when the moment of God's anger arrives, I will curse him. When the moment arrived, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi was sleeping. <laughs> when he woke up, he said to himself, 
conclude from the fact that I nodded off that it is not proper conduct to act in such a way. Mm -hmm. God's mercy is upon all God's creations. It is written and it is, is written and it is written to punish the innocent is surely not right. All right. So Yehoshua ben Levi was a rabbi who lived in Israel in the first half of the third century. And I think here he's kind of the antithesis of Balaam, right? Uh, if we were reading about Yehoshua ben Levi elsewhere in the Talmud, he was beloved and admired actually for being gentle and modest and peaceful and tolerant and really not at all the kind of person you'd expect to try to like take advantage of God's anger in order to get revenge. And I think this is exactly the point that if someone like Yehoshua ben Levi can be provoked to anger that he can't subdue so much that he's willing to try to, you know, try to do this trick with the rooster, uh, you know, even a kind, a kind and sweet person can be dangerous when they're angry. And he plans to exact revenge against uh, apparently an ideological enemy of his who, who torments him, but he, but he fails. He, he falls asleep and he concludes from the fact that he wasn't able to stay awake, that he fell asleep, you know, that what he planned to do was really improper. And he cites uh, two verses, God's mercy is upon all creations and also to punish the innocent is surely not right. What do you think? How, how do you understand those two verses as being supportive of Yoshua ben Levi's conclusion that we shouldn't be doing this? Well, I mean, I think he concluded that because, you know, <laughs> because he fell asleep mm -hmm. uh, and that was God's way of, of demonstrating mercy. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, when I first read this, the part about saying, I will curse him. I thought mm -hmm. initially that he was going to curse the rooster. But oh. <laughs> after reading it again, I realized he was watching the rooster to know when the moment of God's anger arrived. So he could, yes, curse, exactly. the so he could, curse, the, he could curse that heretic. The heretic. Right, right. Sorry, I should have made that more clear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because that's one of God's creatures and God's creations. So you shouldn't get mad at the rooster either. <laughs> kind of well, yes, I but I think it's, right. as you realize, it's not the rooster. Right, right. It's the heretic. So God's mercy is all upon, upon all creations, even heretics. Yeah. Right? Even sinners or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And to punish the innocent is surely not right. This one, This one, I think, is trying to say that even otherwise righteous and, uh, you know, wise people like Rabbi Hoshu ben Levi shouldn't be seeking to punish other people. You know, shouldn't be, yeah, be, because you know, our judgment is imperfect and it gets skewed by, by emotion and bias. You know, Yoshu ben Levi wakes up and I think, you know, he concludes, oh, I shouldn't have done this. But I think it's also probably, that's also probably a function of him just not being that angry anymore after a, after a good night's sleep. Or right. the 16th of a second went by. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess it doesn't, it doesn't say how long he fell asleep. I guess in my right. imagination, he's like trying to stay up late and trying to stay up late and trying to stay up late and, you know, nods off. Oh, but, uh, I would think it would be early in the morning because that's, the paragraph before was when God right. is angry is early stay, in the you morning. You got to stay up all night to get to like, oh, to you know, know you, when you don't, I don't have alarm clocks. You can't just, <laughs> you can't set an alarm clock to wake up except your rooster. I was like, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but did he also conclude that the heretic was, was, was an innocent that. Yeah. You know I'm saying that he's. That Ultimately. Yeah. Didn't deserve this punishment. Truly. Truly. His, his heretical behavior was mm -hmm. an interpretation of verse. This wasn't punishable by whatever yeah. the curse would be. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's spot on, Adam. Yeah, that no matter what this guy has done, you know, wielding this power to just to destroy out of out of anger is yeah is not something we should be we should do. It's not it's not right, right? Right. Okay. So we've answered what God prays. And we've answered when God prays, but there's still kind of one question left, which is, you know, 
really finishing off the why does God pray? Or really, why is it that God is angry every day? Because we haven't actually answered that yet. We, we determined that that, that that is the case, but we haven't actually put our finger on why. Uh, oh, why? You know, Yehoshua ben Levi was, was provoked. He had a guy really upsetting him. So is there something similar for God that's, that's provoking, uh, provoking us? Hmm. I'll read that last line since it's only two. It says, it's a taught in the name of Rabbi Meir. At the time when the sun rises and all the kings of the east and the west place their crowns on their head and bow down to the sun, the Blessed Holy One immediately becomes angry. Hmm. Hmm. So one of, the, one of the reasons I love this passage is it's, I think it all serves to set up this line. And I will admit that breaking the like breaking the text off here is a little bit arbitrary. The agadic material, like the narrative material, actually continues after this. But I think it it's uh, I think it heads in a new different uh, new and different direction after this. So I think there's sort of a setup to this line, or at least I like to read it so that there's a setup to this line. But what's cool about breaking off here is like if we read this line in a vacuum. At the time when the sun rises, the kings of the east and west place their crowns on their head, bow down to the sun, God immediately becomes angry. If we sort of read that in a vacuum without all the setup, we'd say, okay, so what? Like, of course God is angry at idolaters. Like, that's like, that's like the whole point of Torah is like, don't do idolatry, right? Mm -hmm. But instead, it delivers what I think is a, an important and multifaceted message. So why is God angry every day? It's about idolatry. But idolatry by who? The, all of the kings of the East and West. Hmm. So what makes God angry is irresponsible, you know, self-destructive, wrong-headed behavior by people who should know better. The most powerful, influential humans on, on the planet who, at least in theory, should know better. Hmm. So God gets angry because of human behavior every day. Mm -hmm. Because this is an ongoing you know, day-to-day -day sort of nonstop human mishigas kind of a thing. Remember the original premise that was driving this whole passage was that like, we need to be worried about God's anger because it, it's potentially dangerous to us. We know God's getting angry every day because of human nonsense. But is there a world destroying flood every day? Is there a crevasse that swallows up these idolaters every day? Mm -hmm. No, Right. So what does that mean about the effectiveness of God's prayer that God should overcome God's anger? God's pretty good at it. It works, right? God, yeah. is, God prays for self-control and it works. Mm -hmm. God gets angry, <laughs> but God doesn't respond in anger. God tolerates us, right? And furthermore... <laughs> It's actually within our power to not, not make God angry if we, anymore if we were to get our acts together and mm -hmm. do away with this idolatry and things like that. So we don't actually need to worry about God's anger. It's really human anger that's the most imminent danger to us. You know, the, way, the way actions like this um, or you know, any sort of wrongheaded, destructive behavior uh, is potentially a threat to, to other human beings. And, and actually God can serve as our role model. Every day, we too can take on the responsibility for how we behave when we're angry. And, and we can know that doing that is, is basically godly behavior, right? That's what, that's what God does day in and day out. Okay. Yeah, and maybe another take-home message too is that other people can help us with our own anger management the way we oh, sure. have helped God. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so so that's the cool, like once you have this piece at the end, you can sort of like work all the way back through and go, oh, okay, I see, I see the message now. You can go back to God, you know, taking advice from the high priest and say, oh, I realize that this is this is actually really ultimately about us. Remember, that's what it, what we said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. The rabbis are sort of having this discussion about human anger by mapping it onto God, and you can go and say, oh, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to actually take advice from other other people who are good at this. Right. And, and God is supposed to be a role model. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm curious, you know, I, I'd say we should, we should wrap this up pretty soon here. Do you think this is actually possible? Like to, to train yourself to not get angry? Like ever? 
Or so, or at least so that you never ever respond in anger the way a God apparently does. You can teach yourself to moderate any of your emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, what can, about like you can moderate about, your actions? Sure. Yeah. You, you have endocrine glands and things that are going to rile you up, but you can restrain your actions. Yeah. I mean, I like to think so. And at the same time, like, I know I've reacted in anger before and I, like, I have very vivid memories of doing that. Some of them stick out where I'm like, oh man, I really failed at controlling my anger there. There was one time at summer camp where all the kids were being, I was a camp counselor and they were doing something with like, they were like taking all of the napkins out of the napkin dispenser and it was just like, I, and I snapped at them. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I, you know, I was like beating myself up over it. Cause I, it was like, a, I don't know. I felt like a really overreaction to, my, to you know, a, a reaction out of anger. Like there wasn't wrong, anything wrong with being angry, but it was reacting out of anger. Hmm. So yeah, I like to think that it's possible, but at the same time, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. It's really, it's really hard. hard. <laughs> but, it's really hard. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it so that you do get better with age. That's one thing that age will help us get better with. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think that's fair. That's fair. Are you older than you, Rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just I just turned if you're I just turned 38 on uh, on the uh, first day of Passover as a matter of fact. Ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but uh, okay, so actually, so actually, let me ask let me ask some of my uh, some of uh, some folks who've been farther down this path than I have. Um, have you found it like useful to have a role model? Like, do you do you have role models like this for like? you know, control of your anger and, you know, the way that I think this passage is sort of saying, like, let's, let's imagine God and then use God as a role model. But like, yeah, do you have, are there real people you emulate? And has that been helpful? Well, in my case, yes. Um, I would say my father, who probably when mm. I was young, woke up angry every day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> in later years, he was a sweetheart. And I know that it was, he learned to moderate himself and to um, question yeah. and, and huh. to hesitate and to not react like he did when he was young. Yeah, because I saw it. And so he is my role model for that. Yeah. That's really interesting. I've, I've actually witnessed the same thing. Well, I've, I didn't see, I didn't see Amanda's father when, when she was younger, but I, I've told him it was the same thing. And now he's one of the sweetest men I know. Yeah. And actually my, my father too, um, I remember it would come out on the tennis court. We'd play tennis, we'd play tennis together and he would like, lose his temper, throw the racket. <laughs> yeah. And I think at some point he realized that that was actually making him a worse tennis player. <laughs> his, his drive to want to be better got him to want to like get over be <laughs> Yeah, to just like, to, to get over that anger. And it sort of had this ripple effect through through his life. And now, yeah, now it's a lot better. I was, I was sort of the same way at one point too, because I think partially I was, you know, emulating after him. You know, if you control your anger, you control other, like you're, you know, you get better because you control right. yourself better. Right. You're better at things. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I, I have one, I have one more little text to share that, uh, that uh, I'm curious about how you see this is true or not. This is, this is one of my, another classic favorite text from a different part of Talmud. So Rabbi Eli said, in three matters, a person's true character is ascertained. And here, here there's some, some uh, they kind of rhyme in Hebrew, but the koso in their cup, in other words, their, their behavior when they drink, the kiso in their pockets or their purse, in other words, like their financial dealings with other people, ubekaso, and in their anger. And some people also say a person also reveals their nature, besachako, in their, with their laughter. <laughs> So I'm curious, particularly particularly with regard to anger, but also maybe in, with you know in these other regards as well. Do you think this is true? Hmm. That like the way people act when they drink, what they do with their money, and what they do when they're angry, is kind of a window into character. Hmm. <laughs> 
these are all aspects of character. I mean, it can be. They're not the only ones, but I think they're some top level ones. And they speak to different parts of a person's character. Mm. I think. Yeah, say more about that. Um, I mean, when when you're drunk, certain things come out because you lose a lot of self control. Sure. Um, and so that allows you to see some aspects of the person that you wouldn't when they're sober because you mm -hmm. know they're hiding that because of self control. Um, financial dealings. You know, is whether a person is parsimonious or whether they're very giving or sure. you know, those kinds of activities related to financial dealings. Sure. That's that's something that you would that doesn't necessarily come out when they're drunk. <laughs> so, True, but I, right. I I say this at board meetings and things uh, that like you know a, a, an organization's budget is a reflection of their values. Like ultimately, whatever mm -hmm. you spend your money on is what you really care about. Right. Right, yeah. but so that does tell you a lot about their character, right. but the not the same things as when they're drunk. Sure. Right, um, but maybe similar, more similar to what people say when they're angry. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, being anger and being drunk, <laughs> one often gets angry when one is drunk, it seems to me, at least sure, in yeah. my experience. Sure. Having, I mean, my mm. first husband had a lot of problems with mm. alcohol. <laughs> shall we say, was translated into a lot of anger management. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I think even, like, yes, yeah, like alcohol, like, lowers inhibitions and things like that. But I feel like anger, you know, even, I think when it says, you know, a, a person's true character is revealed in their anger, I think it's talking about even times when it's like, sort of okay for them to be like they've been provoked by something like something you know legitimately worth being angry over but the way they react you know what their how their anger is expressed whether it's through you know violence lashing out you know profanity or through uh, you know more dignified responses than that i say chris rock is a good example of that <laughs> okay I, yeah yeah, who got who got slapped on uh, you know in front of uh, in front of everybody at the Oscars? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there was clearly a provocation there. No matter you know who you think is in the right or in the wrong, but the fact that there wasn't a you know a brawl, yeah, maybe that does speak to to inner character. That's that's interesting, Anna. Yeah. yeah. No, he had a lot of restraint. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Well, thank you, friends. Uh, I know this was a long text, but I think it. I think it's really cool and it's fun to, to walk people through it because, um, you know, like the part about the rooster that gets a laugh and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's that's part of what makes this, I don't know, the most the most human part that we have. We have all these different reactions, but also we ended up talking about really in-depth, you know, uh, uh, you know, serious human questions about, how, you know, how do we how do we manage our anger? How do we how do we do that? What is yeah. even uh, you know worth getting angry about? So thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah. This was fun. Thank you. It was very thought provoking. I think. <laughs> but I'm glad.